Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Laura Tsitsigalanos. I am your presenter for today, and it is with great pleasure that I'm hosting this ECI Ground Rounds webinar with exceptional speakers sharing their expertise on the topic COVID vaccination in PID patients. Now, before we get started, let's have a quick look at some of the uh, housekeeping rules here on Zoom. Uh, we, of course, welcome any questions that you might have throughout the webinar, but we kindly ask you to use the Q&A box for those in your Zoom control panel. We have prepared a poll um, and we invite you to participate in the questions that we will be sharing. You can, of course, use the chat box to either say hi or just leave your feedback throughout the webinar. I want you to note that this webinar is recorded. And lastly, I can invite you to fill in the evaluation survey that will pop up at the end of the webinar. Now, without further ado, let me introduce you to today's moderator, Siobhan Burns from the UCL Institute for Immunity and Transplantation of London, UK. Siobhan, welcome. Thanks very much, Lara. And so I have a great uh, pleasure to welcome today a fantastic panel of speakers and panelists. Um, and we are going to hear talks from Isabella Quinty, a consultant immunologist at Sapienza University in Rome, from Professor Alex Richter, a consultant immunologist at the University of Birmingham, um, and also from Martine Purgent, who we're delighted to have as chair of IPOPI, the International Patient Organization, who's going to be uh, bringing us some uh, off, the off the hot press data uh, about patient attitudes and experience with COVID vaccination. Um, and joining me for our panel discussion will be uh, Dr. Klaus Barnatz from Freiburg in Germany, and also Dr. Philomene Herning from Ghent University in Belgium. And so I hope you really enjoy the webinar. Please do uh, post lots of questions. Like um, the last time we had uh, one of the COVID, early COVID um, webinars, we will be looking at all of the questions, even if we don't get to answer them in the webinar, and we'll make a document with answers to go on the Clinical Working Party website uh, after the seminar. Uh, so uh, I hope you really enjoy it. And I'm going to hand over now to Isabella to start off with our first talk. Thank you. So thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm very happy to share our data. And so let me open it. So my topic today, uh, as also the following one, is COVID vaccination in patients with primary antibody deficiency. Uh, I'm Isabella Quinti, for those who don't know me. And uh, I work at the Department of Molecular Medicine at Sapienza University of Rome. So let me start with some epidemiological data. This is the only slide I have on epidemiology. Uh, but since it's very important to know I mean, the background of what we are talking about. Uh, last year, we did a study uh, on, and we tried to calculate, which is the incident, cumulative incidence and the infection fatality rate of uh, the COVID-19 infection in Italy in patients with uh, inborn error of immunity uh, in comparison to the Italian population. So we took advantage of our uh, registry uh, we have a, a, an EPINET registry, the EPINET, this is the site of the EPINET. And so in this registry, we enrolled this number of patients. At that time, we found 131 patients who were SARS-CoV-2 positive. So based on this, we could calculate, since we have the denominator, we could calculate the cumulative incident that was very similar to the one we found at that time in the Italian population. And we could, uh, could also calculate for each disease, and this is the total, the infection fatality rate. And uh, here I show only the data on CVID, since I'm going to talk mainly on CVID. As you can see, uh, both in cumulative incidence and the infection fatality rate is very similar to the one that at that time was reported in the Italian population. So we know that vaccination is the safest and most effective tool to achieve a protective response in immunocompetent individuals. And we know that our society 
the European Society recommends that all patients receive immunization provided that vaccines are based on kill inactivated virus, viruses or on the use of mRNA. The rationale is as for influenza immunization where we have more data, that protection might be generated despite a low or even absent antibody response. But it should be underlined that in the study population of the approval, pre-approval studies for vaccine, any kind of vaccine, no patient with primary immunodeficiency were included, of course. But this is something patients are very scared. The low or even absent anti production of specific antibodies generate a considerable anxiety in the patient population aware of their incapacity to mount an adequate response to infection and immunization because it is perceived as a lack of protection. Are they right or not? Should we immunize patients for COVID-19 despite their incapacity to mount an, an adequate antibody response? Uh, this is a study we published already, the data, and this is the study uh, we did uh, last, is still running now. And at that time, the, when we published, we enrolled in this study, sample with CVID, XLA, and uh, healthy control that, as in all study, are uh, uh, health workers. Uh, this is the study design, so we, uh, had, we, do, we have a first blood sample taken uh, before administration, uh, then they receive the uh, second dose administration, and one week after the second dose, we collect the blood sample again. And we check for serum antibodies, we check for memory B cells and B cells in general, and for T cell response. Let me go directly to the data because uh, I have many data to show. And uh, first of all, uh, we check for the anti-spike antibodies. Uh, these are only IgG, but here I have also IgA and IgM, if you want to say. And this is the normal control, and this is our patient population. And so only one third of patients with CVID uh, respond to low level of specific IgG after two doses of uh, the, uh, let me uh, use the commercial name because it's much easier, the Pfizer uh, uh, vaccine. And as you can see here, uh, the IgG, IgA and IgM raise, titers raise in all um, our control population and uh, all uh, in general, our patients have an increase, but as I said, only one third increase the level and the level remain much lower than the one we found in the normal population. This is true for IgG, this is true for IgM, and this is true also for IgA. But when I uh, have to make a graph of uh, this data, uh, here you can see what I just said with individual data. This is the baseline. These are IgG against S1. And these are the number of patients that make some level of antibodies. This is the range of the normal donors. Uh, but again, we did something else. We also analyzed 34 convalescent patients, uh, CVAD again. And then we also analyzed convalescent patient after the first dose of uh, uh, vaccine, Pfizer vaccine. And uh, as you know, the rules prescribe to be immunized with one dose of RNA vaccine in patients who already were infected by SARS-CoV-2. As you can see here, the level of convalescent, uh, the antibody level of convalescent patients were much higher than what we found in patients uh, that were immunized by two doses. But most importantly, uh, this patient, uh, after the first dose of uh, mRNA vaccine, uh, have a much higher level. The vast majority of them produce antibody, and the vast majority of them produce antibodies of higher level than the immunized one. And now I go to the cellular part. Uh, with, I'm going to talk mainly on uh, uh, B cells, even because Alex will talk also on T cells. I just mentioned a few things on P B cells, on T cells. And you, you know that thanks to the availability of trimeric spy that was bind to a very bright fluorescence and the same trimeric spy coupled to a moderate brightness fluorescence dye, 
we could identify two types of memory B cells that were single positive or with high affinity or maybe with higher binding affinity uh, for the spike protein and we call them spike plus plus. Uh, in healthy donor, in agreement with the timing of germinal center reaction, specific IgG memory B cells with high affinity for trimeric spike, spike significantly, significantly increase uh, seven days after the second dose of vaccine. And this is what happens in uh, our patient. This is a, um, a little complicated slide. I just mentioned uh, that we found an increase in uh, uh, memory B cell, specific in a healthy donor, uh, 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 spike one plus and spike two plus classical memory, memory B cells. And also we found an increase in activated memory B cells but also we found an increase in atypical memory B cells. Atypical memory B cells were identified as CD19, positive CD24, 38, uh, CD1, uh, negative cells. And also this is the level of plasma blast that in normal donors increase. What we found in CVID? Uh, in CVID, we have an increase only in, uh, it's better I show you here, uh, in CVID, we can see a very small uh, increase in the uh, spike memory B cells, spike one plus memory B cells, uh, while CVID patients do not make a uh, generate after vaccination any spike uh, specific memory B cells with high affinity for the spike protein. And, but more surprisingly, we found that uh, in our patients, we can observe only the increase, the generation of memory B, of uh, atypical memory B cells uh, with very uh, low uh, affinity for the spike, but they do not generate any uh, high level, uh, high specific uh, cells. So to those of vaccination induce spike specific B cells inside of the atypical memory population with low binding capacity. And at that time we suggest that the B cell response occurred mostly at the extra follicular side. But we go on. Uh, we check for the uh, receptor binding domain uh, memory B cells in healthy donors. And you can see here the percentage of uh, receptor binding uh, domain in binding uh, memory B cells. And they were completely absent in our patient population. So in uh, uh, healthy donors, receptor binding domain positive cells are a fraction of the memory B cell generated after vaccination. Uh, in general, they represent about 20% of the total uh, memory B cell response, but the receptor binding domain positive memory B cells were completely undetectable in uh, patient with CVID. Now I go to T cells specific memory T cells. And again, we can see an increase in the uh, percentage of memory B cells in our patient population, but this increase is much lower than what we saw in the uh, healthy donors. So we can conclude from this. That patient with a variable frequency, differently from what, uh, for example, Klaus Barnard demonstrated from specific T cells produced after multiple exposure to a viral antigen following influenza virus immunization and infection. Uh, so let me summarize what we found upon, upon two doses of vaccine. So in healthy donors, we found specific IgG, IgA, and IgM. Classical, specific, uh, specific classical memory B cells with high and low binding capacity, and the most spike specific memory B cells, receptor binding domain specific cells were generated. And in all, also in a healthy donor, we found activated memory B cells with high and low binding capacity, a typical memory B cell only with low binding capacity, plasma blasts with low and high binding capacity, and specific T cell response. What happens uh, upon two doses in CVID? One third of patients produce low level of spike specific IgG and IgA. I'm not mentioning here IgM. Uh, spike specific classical and activated 
memory B cells were not generated, never, very few. Receptor binding domain, specific memory B cells were not generated, indicating the incapability of CVID B cells to undergo somatic mutation and affinity maturation in the germinal center indispensable for the production of neutralizing antibodies. But we found that atypical memory B cells with low binding capacity to spike protein were generated. Are these short-lived activated cells in the process of differentiating into plasma cells or and produced by extra follicular reaction or a failure of germinal center reaction? We will see now after the third dose what's going to happen. And again, high affinity plasma blasts were not produced and one third only of patients generated the low affinity plasma blast. Uh, but we have data upon infection and one dose of vaccine in CVID patients who were previously infected with SARS-CoV-2, the IgG response was boosted by the subsequent immunization showing that SARS-CoV-2 infection effectively primed the immune response. And after immunization, CVID patients convalescent for SARS-CoV-2 generated differently from the one who were immunized, uh, generate classical specific memory B cells. So we can conclude from now that since natural infection responses are boosted by subsequent immunization, the comparison of immune response generated by vaccine and the infection shed light on the difference between an antigen-driven response and an infection driven response, where the innate response directs the subsequent adaptive immune response. So this is very similar to what has been uh, widely published in healthy donors. Now we go <clears throat> after three doses. Uh, uh, so this is the same sample. These are paid sample. Uh, I didn't put the line in order to make clear the slide, but these are the same patient at baseline, immunized after two doses and immunized after three doses. As you can see here, the level we reach after three doses is much higher than the level we reach at the second dose after two doses. And even the number of patients that, that respond was much higher. What about uh, B cells? Uh, same. Uh, these are the baseline. This is the percentage of memory B cell spike uh, low binding capacity. Uh, immunized two doses, very few, but after three doses, uh, this is the range of uh, uh, normal donors. Uh, some patients go even higher than the normal donors. So after three doses, the pattern of B cell response completely changed and uh, uh, a typical memory B cells completely disappear. Only one patient continue to have it, to show it. But we, there is a shift from a typical memory B cells to classical memory B cells, but again, with low, active, low, low binding capacity to the spike protein. We cannot find memory B cells with high binding capacity for spike protein. So the summary up, up on three doses of vaccine, the antibody response increase in one third of patients who or red responders as one third of no responders with few data on monoclonal antibody, we just published this paper. And uh, so we, we, uh, we treated our patient soon as, uh, after infection with monoclonal antibodies. And in the paper, we show that the mean time, median time of SARS-CoV-2 positivity was 22 days in eight patients treated with monoclonal antibodies plus standard of care versus 37 days in the 10 patients treated only with standard of okay care therapy. But again, median time of positivity, SARS-CoV-2 positivity from monoclonal administration was 10 days. And the main 
suggestion from these papers was that monoclonal antibodies treatment was effective and well tolerated. But let's say uh, what, what happens on the epidemiological point of view. So after two doses vaccination, we had one patient uh, who had SARS-CoV-2 infection after two doses and he recovered. Uh, we have one patient who recovered, but in this patient we use soon as, it, as uh, we detect the infection, the monoclonal antibodies. And here we have a bad result. So another CVID uh, had the infection after two doses vaccination. She was treated with monoclonal antibody, but she died. And let me summarize this. her story. Uh, in January, in January 21, uh, she had COVID-19 and she remained on long COVID. Uh, she was immunized in April with first dose, in May with the second dose. In October, she had the third. Uh, in October, she had a, a new COVID infection. And unfortunately, despite monoclonal antibodies, she died. But uh, what about the three doses uh, vaccination? Uh, we have only one patient who had again a SARS-CoV-2 infection. This is the summary. Uh, October 2020, he had the first COVID uh, infection. Uh, he received the first Pfizer on March 21, the second dose of Pfizer in April 21. Uh, in October 1st, he had the, the third doses, but October 30, uh, after one month after the second, the third dose, he had again SARS-CoV-2 infection, and also this patient was treated with monoclonal antibody and he recovered. So let me go to the conclusion. So we can conclude that T and B cell responses differ between infected and vaccinated individuals, suggesting that inflammatory responses associated with infection influence the trajectory of the adaptive immune response. A CVID patient, although be able to respond to SARS-CoV-2 vaccination, may nevertheless fail to be protected because their antibody levels are low. Antibody response induced by natural infections was significantly enhanced by subsequent immunization, and this underlined the need to immunize convalescent patients after recovery. But of course, new strategy may be necessary, such as multiple shots. We don't know how many times we might we should vaccinate our patient, or possibly the use of different type of vaccine, including those with inactivated virus that might mimic better the natural infection or with higher content of antigen or with an adjuvant. Uh, but reinfection with SARS-CoV-2 after vaccination has been documented. And at present, uh, SARS-CoV-2 patient uh, might benefit from the new preventing strategy as SARS-CoV-2 monoclonal antibodies used as treatment soon after infection or maybe as prophylaxis in particular in those patients who did not respond after three doses of vaccine. And of course, we are waiting for the newly produced lot of gamma globulin that will contain spike-specific IgG that might be helpful in the future. And I thank you for the attention. Thanks, Isabella. So, Alex, hopefully you're going to take over now and um, just continue with your presentation. Thank you, Siobhan, and thank you to Isid um, for inviting me to come along today to um, share some of the UK experience that we have uh, looking at vaccination in our immune deficiency patients. Um, my name is Alex Richter. I'm a professor of clinical immunology at the University of Birmingham. And I've been working uh, with Siobhan on a national study called COVAD. And we're looking at the immunological responses to SARS-CoV-2 natural infection and vaccination in individuals with antibody deficiency to try and apportion the relative risk um, to immune competence. Um, so we're hoping uh, um, to recruit just over a thousand patients with antibody deficiency in the UK. And these will include primary and secondary immune deficiency patients. Um, anyone is eligible who is receiving immunoglobulin replacement and has reached that bar of antibody deficiency. 
Oh, I've just seen that you can't see my slides. Let me just try and share that again. Thank you. If someone could just let me know that you can now see. Fantastic. Okay, um, uh, so any patient receiving immunoglobulin replacement therapy and any patient with a low IgG, so less than four grams per liter, who are on prophylactic antibiotics for significant infections under the care of immunology. So we're recruiting three different arms to this study. The first arm is our what I call a, our pick a winner arm. So we wanted to recruit individuals that were infected in the first or second waves um, who'd had COVID and examining their response post natural infection. We then have the largest arm, which is arm two. And this was our monitoring arm. We were looking for infections in these patients so that we could then recruit them into arm two to determine what their immune response was in a much more controlled manner following natural infection. Now, this study was set up last summer prior to vaccinations being um, introduced. And so this study then morphed into examining the immune responses to vaccination in these groups. Um, so in order to do that, we would get a baseline sample. And then in the UK, we used both the AZ and the Pfizer study. We didn't determine this as this was an observational study. We would then get a second sample, either one, um, one month post second dose. And then as we all know, this autumn um, rates have increased again, and we know more about vaccine waning. And so in the UK, a third primary dose has been recommended for patients with immune deficiency. And so we have tried to use a long-term sample, so a six month sample post that primary course as the pre-third sample dose. And then we will bleed patients again 28 days after this third dose, and we will follow them up at six months to see what has happened. Now for all patients coming into the study, um, we're doing a nasal pharyngeal swab um, we were aware at the beginning of the study that a number of patients had chronic virus and we weren't aware whether it was possible to have asymptomatic infection and significant antibody deficiency. Um, so we, we set up with a charity enabled to do this um, in the comfort of their own home and then patients would send in their swab for PCR testing. And then for the great majority of patients who were shielding, um, we developed and um, validated a remote dry blood spot testing. So we were able to equivalently detect COVID antibodies in a fingerprint capillary um, dry blood spot. And, um, but we would then have in depth venous blood in about 200 individuals to enable the cellular work that we um, are hoping to do and are doing. So we've recruited 550 um, individuals to date. And the first analysis that we've done is on the first 320 patients. So data um, post-vaccination, if we look at the antibodies first, if we look at the graph and we look at the three dot plots, the third dot plot from the pitch cohort is a healthy control cohort. And you can see that these individuals have all made a response to vaccination. In the UK, most healthcare um, professionals had the Pfizer vaccine. And then if you look at the two graphs to the left, this is our remote sampling cohort who had it by dry blood spot or DBS and um, those that were measured by serum. Um, the first thing to say is you can see there is no difference between the DBS and, and the serum results. But slightly higher numbers than um, Isabella found, we found that 55.6% of our antibody deficiency patients have made some antibody test. Now this is a high sensitivity um, ELISA. So we know that we're picking up that very low end of antibody. It's also a combined ELISA. So we are detecting IgG, IgA and IgM. And some of that may explain the differences with, with Isabella's data. 
But reasonably optimistic, that, and it just shows how immunogenic these vaccines are, you know, compared to standard vaccines we use like pneumococcus, because by definition, all of these patients will not have responded to pneumococcal vaccination. We're getting something. But what you can see is the amount of antibody is much lower than our healthy controls. And we're just getting our neutralization data back at the moment. And we're finding that these lower um, antibodies are also of a pure, poorer quality and we're getting lower neutralization titers. So we have a, a small cohort of samples where um, just by coincidence for where they were recruited, we had post first and second dose samples. Um, samples. And as you can see here, um, the antibody response post the second dose was only 32%, but this has gone up significantly in this cohort up to 67% um, post second vaccine. So this really shows that there is, you know, dosing is important and getting the right numbers of doses is important. And, you know, similar to Isabella, we are finding now that this third dose is, is um, boosting once again antibody levels in our patients. But I think the other thing that we've found is that if you don't respond to one vaccine at all, you are less likely to respond to a second. And I haven't got the data to show you today on the boosters, but we're finding something very similar with the third dose. If you can't respond at all to the first or second um, vaccine, you're unlikely to respond to the third. But if you make something, even these low level antibodies, then it is likely you have the ability to boost. And we were trying to find uh, risk factors um, that would predict the magnitude of the um, serological response. And I guess not surprisingly, but the pre-treatment IgG strongly associated with better antibody responses to COVID vaccination. So you can see that there are probably a few um, SPADs in here that have ended up on immunoglobulin, but the great majority of individuals had a pre um, SCIG or IVIG um, total titer of, of less than four. So, you know, your serological response is defined by your original immune competence. Um, and we have worked with a company called Oxford Immunitech who make, um, who previous to COVID made T-spots to um, TB testing in the UK. And they've been working with the key national studies to deliver the, a similar test, but for um, SARS-CoV-2. Um, and so we were very grateful that they would support our study. So unfortunately, we found that only 52% of individuals made a T cell response to a spike um, peptide pool. Now, I think that was lower than we anticipated. Um, I don't know about um, everyone else, but we tend to give the flu vaccine every year to our patients in the hope that they're going to make some T cell response or other parts of their immune system um, give them some protection. So we were a bit disappointed by this level. Um, a couple of things to say. Um, we couldn't do this test on those that had significant lymphopenia. Um, because you couldn't correct for the cell numbers on their automated system. Um, so we are going to look again with our own LE spots to see if we can potentially develop a slightly more sensitive system for um, immune deficiency patients um, with lymphopenia. And the other thing to say is that um, a significant, the, the amount of um, T cell response is not what we were expecting because we find individuals, and I'll show this in a minute, who can produce an antibody response but can't make a T cell response, which doesn't make a huge amount of immune sense. And so we think um, what we're seeing is that potentially the antibody assay is more sensitive than the T cell assay, and there may well be um, some low level T cell responses that we're not detecting. But my overall summary from this is that, you know, if you look at, you know, student grades of A, B and C, 
you know, this certainly isn't an A or an A plus, you know, we are, you know, only getting some T cell responses um, to compensate for the lack of antibodies. Similar to the antibodies, your T cells go up um, between your first and your second doses. So you can boost that T cell response. And again, those that make no response at the beginning are less likely to make a response later. And if you compare the antibodies with the T cell response, there is this broad trend towards um, an increased antibody with increased antibodies responses and T cell responses. But, the, the, you know, they don't correlate completely. You know, so your XLAs, which have no antibodies, make absolutely fabulous T cell responses as being reported as well. Um, but we, you know, have this problem that some individuals don't make T cell responses when they make antibody responses. We had the opportunity, obviously, in the UK to compare um, our vaccines and our responses to the vaccines. And what we found that with antibody responses post Pfizer, you had a higher titer and more patients responding to the vaccine. But there was no difference with um, T cells. And in fact, we've got a number of studies that have shown that um, the T cell response post the AZ vaccine, um, the, the Chadox vaccine, um, does seem to be more equivalent, um, if not slightly enhanced compared to the Pfizer. So because of the size of the cohort, we are able to look um, a little bit at the antibody responses per underlying cause. And this is the antibody responses on the left and the T cell responses on the right. And I think you can see that um, the CVID patients, you know, they're, they're, they're almost two groups here. We've got um, patients that make absolutely no responses. And then we make patient, we have patient groups that do make some responses. And actually, it may be interesting going forward to then, you know, go back and look at the genomics of these people and the phenotyping of these people to see whether this more immunogenic vaccine is able to differentiate those more likely to have significant infections and a more significant immune defect. Um, as we've reported before, great T cell responses in the XLA group. Um, and... The other thing that we found was in the secondary immune deficiencies, T cell rep the responses are, you know, even lower than the CVID patients. Um, so whilst we all know that a number of CVID patients are more like a combined um, immune deficiency, we know that many of our SIDS are a combined immune deficiency as they are on T cell immune suppression or still recovering post transplant. So just last little bit on breakthrough infections, because of the longitudinal nature of this study, we've already had 11 breakthrough infections post vaccination. Now, the reason I bring this up is just to show you, well, two things. One is that predominantly for us, the breakthrough infections have been with the AZ vaccine. Um, we haven't you know, looked at this in terms of statistical significance yet, as this has only just been put together. But given that there were equivalent groups in vaccination, it does look like the AZ is overrepresented. And the other thing to say is that four of those 11 patients had reasonable um, antibody responses post vaccination. So we're not seeing the breakthrough infection solely in those that make no antibody response. And I think it's worth remembering at this point that the vaccines were all against developed against the Wuhan strain. And we know from data from the Crick Institute and Rupert Beale that cross reactivity and the ability to neutralize the Delta virus with Wuhan antibodies or even alpha antibodies is not as effective. So I guess I'm not that surprised that we have individuals with antibodies post-vaccination who are getting breakthrough infections. So yes, Freedom Day for many, um, but, but not for all. And our patients are um, continuing to be at risk of COVID. Thank you for everyone that's um, taken part in our study.
I believe Sivan is disconnected, but Martin, please go ahead with your presentation and thank you very much, Alex, for presenting. Thank you very much. Um, thank you to Ezid for welcoming a patient perspective. Uh, but I have to say that this is a joint effort from IPOPI, Ezid and Ingrid. And uh, there's survey, vaccination survey uh, among patients with uh, uh, PID uh, aimed at addressing two uh, topics. One is the hesitancy and the second is the side effects. Um, oops. So first of all, um, the survey was drafted in a joint effort, as I said, so you can see the names uh, that, uh, of the people who were committed. Um, the, the questionnaire was sent through uh, IPOPI national members by emailing, but also on the social media. Uh, it went from uh, July uh, 66th, uh, uh, 26th, oh, sorry, to September 30th. And at that time, uh, we had a, an extension meaning that at the beginning of the survey, uh, it was not really about a third um, uh, dose. Um, this uh, questionnaire was uh, administrated online um, in English, but also translated in other languages, as you can see. And as uh, when we come to severity, I have to say that we took uh, the um, nomenclature of the NIH, -A, NIH uh, with mild, moderate, and severe, as you can read uh, just here. Then, as per the analysis, I want to address a, a very a big thank you to Levi Host, who uh, worked with um, uh, Philomene uh, Herring, and thank you to Philomene for providing such a great support. So uh, we worked through the SPSS. Um, so as you can see, uh, we just had recorded a variable and input negative selection. And for that, we ignored patients without a PID diagnosis, ignored doubles, and addressed the, 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 the following uh, variables, age, category, regions, IUIS, uh, diagnosis group, uh, side effects grouping. So thank you for uh, this analysis to Levy. So first of all, respondent uh, characteristics. Um, First, you can see that we had uh, addressed a lot of uh, countries and the, the most prevalent countries are uh, on the top. You can see Germany, um, Sweden, France, Belgium, United Kingdom, Italy, etc. So this is the, the main bulk, even if this was split into a um, different region. But also the second big bulk is uh, from the United States with 390. So this is uh, very interesting to have the two parts or the two sides of the, the Atlantic Ocean. Um, when coming here, sorry, I have to minimize this. Um, demographic, almost three uh, quarters of the survey was completed by females and, uh, and also the females were significant, uh, significantly older than male. This is something that uh, we often see in survey, I have to say that female address more, uh, respond more. And even when it comes from uh, uh, about male patients, especially when they are young, most of the time this is women who uh, are answering uh, the, 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 the questionnaire. So this is something that we can see in other kind of survey. <clears throat> Um, a majority of patients have a pre predominancy antibody deficiency, uh, as you can see here. So this is the, 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 the whole uh, amount of pre uh, predominantly uh, antibody deficiency. So 86% uh, uh, of the sample. And here you can see the different conditions. Um, also, we have an unclassified antibody deficiency, which consists of patients with combined antibody deficiencies without a CVID diagnosis. Uh, so this can be a mix of different or even people who don't know exactly the name of their condition, whether they don't know whether it has not been uh, given to them or uh, identified even. So um, half of the cohort consists of patients with CVID. As per the age, um, so as we said, there are significantly more females and older patients among uh, antibody deficiency as compared in other PID diagnostic groups. So you can see here that um, antibody deficiency are, um, cons consists in 75% uh, of the sample. 
Uh, and then um, you can see the other categories and, and you can see also the age given uh, by category here. And given uh, compared to the I, uh, USA uh, uh, category, you can see here how uh, the different um, uh, conditions are spread and by age, going from uh, almost zero to uh, some, something around 80 years old. Um, over 80% of the patients are on immunoglobulin replacement. This, is what, this was one of the, the, the questions. And of course, this, this is completely fair given the fact that we have a lot of antibody uh, patients. Um, you can see here uh, among the, the antibody deficiency, 85 and un unclassified disease, also a lot of them, and, um, and this continues like this. So let's go now to uh, COVID-19 infection and vaccination, because this was something we addressed as well, asking them uh, about uh, the fact they had, had the infection prior to vaccination. And in the sample, we had uh, 19 infection prior uh, to vaccination, which is not a lot. And uh, so this means that we have around uh, 89% of the sample where uh, people did not get uh, the, the, the COVID-19. And among those who got it, uh, you can see that um, some were asymptomatic, those uh, with mild symptoms, moderate symptoms, and uh, severe symptoms here. And severe symptoms is quite a lot, but we have to think that this is a definition which is given by patients, uh, as I said at the beginning of this uh, presentation, and severe uh, from them mean that they can't have their uh, normal activities. Um, so uh, daily difficult or quite impossible, yes. At this, uh, absence, um, there is an absence of evidence for certain PID uh, diagnosis that are affected more severely when they are infected, when we compare. So asymptomatic, mild, moderate, and severe, and we go to those, um, those conditions, we can't really uh, see uh, any uh, specific, maybe a, a bit of agamadolpidinemia here. Uh, that we can find in the other, but the sample is pretty uh, uh, little in that, so I'm not sure we can take any conclusion on that. No universal prioritization for PID. This was a question. Did were, were your uh, PID patient prioritized in your country? And you can see that uh, it depends, of course, on the region. You can here at the, the, the spread of the, the results. Not at all. Um, you can see that, of course, Africa, but this is so little symptom, so, uh, sample. So I, I would keep on the three first. And uh, we can see that maybe Western Europe, um, the patients were um, prioritized, maybe more than in other region. And here, uh, later time, uh, again, uh, Western Europe, uh, maybe more, and then North America, and then Eastern Europe. Um, so, over 90% uh, uh, of the population uh, is fully vaccinated. In fact, in this survey, we um, intended to address uh, people uh, who were at that time fully vaccinated, meaning having two, uh, two jabs, uh, two doses. Um, and then we also wanted to address people who were only one time and then didn't want to go further. And then we wanted also to address people who did not want at all to be vaccinated. So it means also that we excluded people who had only had one doses or people who could not access to vaccination because this, is, this happens as well in, in, the, in the world. So although small numbers, there are significant more um, patients that do not wish to be vaccinated at, at all in Africa and Eastern, but this is so uh, small um, numbers, um, but significant, significantly more patients with prior SARS-CoV-2 infection don't want either uh, to be vaccinated at all, and maybe because they think that they are immune because of that, this is something that should be uh, tested, but uh, you can see that I am fully vaccinated, uh, and you can see here the most uh, relevant um, data. 
Um, when it comes to um, the major, the majority of patients, more than 80% uh, received an uh, RNA-based uh, vaccine, and mostly, of course, uh, Pfizer. Um, and you can see that for the first and the second uh, shot, this is the blue side. Third shot, well, we have thought, at, at the time we had some country who had decided to go for to a, a third shot uh, for PID patients, but very. Uh, very little uh, countries, very few countries. Um, then we can see that Moderna comes uh, very strongly, then uh, AZ, and then uh, the other, meaning um, GNG, uh, Sputnik, and Covivac. So the two uh, Russian ones, uh, they, they, they come uh, later, uh, far, far later. Um, 20 for 25% uh, of patients could choose the brand of COVID-19 vaccine, as you can see. Um, and um, if this was offered a choice, significantly less AZ and significantly more Sputnik, but I'm not sure that with Sputnik, they had really the choice, to be honest. Um, anyway, um, <clears throat> we, we can see here the numbers uh, about uh, vaccination, uh, no choice of vaccine, uh, which is mainly the, the case, but some uh, people could show, and we can see that this is uh, for Pfizer that this goes. Um, about combination of different vaccines, we, we could see that this this did not happen very uh, often because um, yeah, six, uh, ninety seven percent had uh, the same vaccine with the first and the second dose. A vaccine per age, uh, this is also a significant difference in terms of age group, which is not surprising. More Moderna in older patients and more Pfizer, AZ and Sputnik in the youngest. Uh, well, for AZ, it may be a bit more astonishing, but um, this uh, you can see here with the uh, analytics down uh, that uh, these are uh, statistically uh, relevant. Um, so with the, this, um, this age group. So let's come to hesitancy. Um, over one uh, fifth of the patient denoted hesitancy prior to uh, COVID vac uh, vaccination, um, which is maybe less than we uh, could have uh, thought. Anyway, um, and we can see also that more hesitancy was present among female and in North American and Eastern European countries. Uh, when you see the, sli the, the, the split here, uh, so female, we had 77%, uh, um, no hesitancy and uh, more for male. And when you come to the countries here, the sample once again are not uh, significant, but when we come to the uh, most important samples, we can see that uh, Eastern Europe, the yes was pretty high. Uh, North America as well, it's 20%. Here. And uh, Western Europe, we had uh, around 20. Again, reason for hesitancy. This is something that I was really interested to, to know because, uh, of course, this is very important for us as patient representative. First of all, and this is the main one, you can see this is unsure protection. Uh, because of my PID, they did not know if that would work or not. So this is really a PID linked reason. The second one is a more general public reason, concerns on negative uh, long-term effects of this vaccine that we don't know. And uh, this is the second one. The third one is again linked to the condition, concerns on possible allergies. And, uh, the, and the fifth one here, you can see no confidence in the science behind the vaccines. And again, this is more a general public uh, reason than the other uh, minus uh, one. But nevertheless, we uh, wanted to address one uh, because uh, from the field, we, we heard about that. Uh, it, it is about um, advice against was more frequent in Eastern uh, European countries and Oceania, but very small samples. Um, well, the, the opinion of the PID specialist, and you can see uh, some specialists advise against, some specialists uh, advise to wait. And uh, you can see that among small numbers, of course, because uh, this is so, but um, we can see that the, the, those two reasons are um, established, and especially for Eastern Europe. 
and um, a bit less for uh, North America. Here, the sample is so small, and uh, also here, Western uh, Europe. Uh, so, well, this this is a um, yeah pretty many patient who uh, maybe did not know how to handle uh, the the advice from the specialist. Um, we can also note that advice against occurred uh, more in patients with congenital defect of phagocytes number of functions so may and in disease of immune uh, dysregulation which uh, of course uh, links to uh, medical reasons um, advice to wait occurred more in patients with immune suppressants other than steroids as uh, those uh, without safety um, so we again uh, had, uh, we, we just addressed the two uh, last modalities, meaning moderate and severe reactions. After the first, the second, once again, the third, we had not so many people. And then we have after at least one dose. And uh, we split also uh, those uh, reactions between local reaction and systemic reactions. And this is interesting that, uh, yeah, we have a pretty high proportion of uh, adverse event, uh, reported adver uh, adverse event, um, and especially a pretty high percentage of high effect. You can see that we raise a 27% for, uh, after at least one dose. But there, once again, we have to consider that severe is from the patient perspective, meaning that they can't do their usual work or usual activities. Uh, they are difficult or quite impossible. So, um, and here we have a split between uh, those um, th those uh, three uh, shots, and and we can see that the most severe uh, happened maybe a bit more after uh, the um, the second shot. Um, and the third shot is not so significant because we don't have such a big um, sample here. Patients with at least uh, one severe adverse, uh, adverse events were more frequently female uh, from 18 uh, to uh, 55. And uh, from European countries as compared to North America, for example. Um, but we did not uh, see any difference between uh, PIDs, uh, the underlying PIDs. So you can see here the ranges um, of severe so 33% uh, for female compared to 20 for male. And here you can see that this is the biggest uh, group um, with the age. And, uh, and then again, you can see that uh, this is the main, the, the most important group, Eastern Europe and then Western and then North America may be correlated to uh, the knowledge, the medical knowledge or the medical communication. I don't know, this is to, to, to look for. Um, more severe uh, adverse event occurred after the first dose of AZ and G J and J, as you can read, less after Pfizer. And we have here uh, significant uh, results uh, on that. Um, and um, also in patients with the severe COVID-19 prior, prior to vaccination uh, that we can see here. Last, uh, there, there was no, uh, there, there was also more hesitancy in patients that declared having uh, ad adverse events. So is this a possible bias? This is quite possible. Uh, and you can see here uh, when people uh, have no hesitancy, um, you can see that the, 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 the rate of the, the severe reaction raises with the, 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 the rate of hesitancy. So th this may be, um, uh, a cause to effect a reason, I don't know. Um, the majority of adverse events occurred within the first days. Uh, you can see same days and, uh, and the, the day after the vaccination, with the, which is the, the, the most. And we, when we summarized the three first, we have the, the, the most important group. Uh, the duration of the severe side effects were uh, mainly uh, one, two, three uh, days as you can see here, but some lasted more than a week. Um, action taken, and there we can uh, crisscross with the severity uh, uh, thing, because no action taken, you can see this is the, the most important, not the most, but uh, equally to self-medication group, and then a physician visit, emergency room, so very uh, few patients, and hospitalization, same. 
and uh, resolving of uh, side effects, uh, self-resolved main group, resolve uh, after treatment, would it be self-administrated or prescribed? A very important group, and then still having a generalized symptoms, and this is again around six uh, percent of the population. More uh, self-medication in North America, more patients without action taken uh, in Western Europe, and more, um, well, two cases, so I, I won't speak of that. Um, but uh, you, you can see that uh, emergency room, this is quite empty. Uh, but this is, of course, interesting to have a look at the single patient uh, who are there, especially those, uh, to see uh, what was the reason for this. And we have more, uh, yeah, maybe I can... Uh, go back to that, uh, just to, to see um, emergency visits, so uh, very uh, five, five patients, so you can see the kind of condition, and maybe the PID has not a lot to do with that, or maybe it has, like here, for example, uh, anemia or other kind of uh, underlying conditions. And same here uh, about serious effect, but not requiring uh, hospitalization. And we can see again the reason for admission. Um, and this is something that maybe we need to uh, dig a little bit more in. So as a conclusion, and sorry if I have a bit long comprehensive data set to present a unique information from a broad demographical and geographical range from patient. And I, again, I'm very thankful to Ezid and to my um, um, colleague from Ezid and Ingi to have enthusiastically worked uh, together uh, on that. Low SARS-CoV-2 incidence, but relative severe disease course, um, also uh, we have no uh, information about hospitalization really, preparedness to vaccination correlated inversely to, with prior uh, COVID-19, hesitancy was mainly related to concerns on protection because underlying PID, but also some kind of uh, general public uh, assumptions. Advice against postponing um, vaccination was more frequent in non-Western countries and more severe adver uh, adverse events, although uh, serious events requiring ER visits or hospitalization remained rare, where a typical AE as previous, uh, pre previously reported in the general population. Thank you very much for your attention. And of course, this is open uh, for discussion. Great, thanks, Martine. Um, if I could ask all the panelists to put your camera back on and to unmute. And Laura, if I could ask you to collapse the slides so that we appear in the main screen, that would be great. Um, I would like to welcome Klaus, who's joined us since the beginning. Hi, Klaus. Um, so I'm just going to say to the panelists at the very beginning, we've only got a quarter of an hour. Um, I'm keen that we don't overrun too much because uh, we've committed to trying to keep this at 75 minutes. So there are a few, there are some questions in the Q&A and there are some very specific questions I want to ask you. So I'm going to ask you to try and keep your answers reasonably brief. Um, and it might be worth thinking about when with the questions, what's the evidence and what's your opinion? So um, I'm going to ask Alex and Isabella first. Uh, what do you think COVID responses mean in practice? What are we going to say to our patients about um, antibody levels, which are positive but lower than healthy controls and T cell responses, which are positive but lower than healthy controls. So I think, hey, Alex, do you want to go first? I think it's a pragmatic um, answer, really. Um, we don't use the antibody responses to other vaccines to tell them about their protection against pneumococcus or Hib or MenC. But we use it as a marker, don't we, of their immune competence. So if they have um, slightly low, if they have low antibodies or they have no antibodies, we know that they are going to be more likely to be at risk of infection. Um, and I think that stands true. So you could argue that outside of a study, there isn't real value in measuring antibody responses. But I know from personal experience that patients like to know. And so, you know, we, we are measuring but we don't know what a protective antibody response is. We don't know what a protective T cell response is. And actually, even if you have an antibody level, Siobhan, we don't know whether it's neutralizing, especially against the variants. Isabella, do you want to add anything to that or do you broadly agree with what Alex has said? I think we don't have the answer. So it's much clear to, we should be clear with our patient. 
because they know about their immune defect. So I think we don't have to say nothing more than keep the distance, be protected as much as you can, and tell us if you have a contact, because I strongly believe that the monoclonal antibodies we have now is a good opportunity to stop the infection as soon as the infection come out. So I think we don't have to give any uh, answer, but this is true also for the normal population. I don't think people should check for the antibodies level. Okay. I think it doesn't make any sense. Okay, and um, what, what's our recommendation about additional vaccines then? Um, what would you two say? And then Klaus, I'm going to ask you, what's your, what's your advice to your patients? So Alex and Isabella first, what's your advice about additional vaccines? So I think what's, the evidence, what's your opinion? This is again is pragmatic advice. And what we're seeing from our studies and other studies that if it is probably worth vaccinating, and certainly if you get even a low level of antibody response, there is a really good chance that you can boost that. So I think um, dosing matters. So, you know, probably, well, two is better than one, three is better than two. Um, don't know if everyone agrees. Isabella, do you want to come in and then close? Yeah, I show the data after the third dose. Of course, the third dose improve everything. Improve the number of patients who responded, they improve the quality of B cell response, improve the quality of T cell response. So for sure, they should be vaccinated. Uh, this doesn't mean that we reach the optimum, but uh, I think this is a general question. Our patients should be vaccinated with many vaccines as much as, they, as we can, because I think their immune response might be modulated also by vaccine. And actually, Isabella, the other interesting opportunity we have through COVID is to look at different vaccine modalities and how our immune deficiency patients respond to them. And yes, you know, there was, I was a sentence in my conclusion. Uh, I said that we, for sure, we prove uh, uh, what has been proved out in uh, healthy donors, that natural infection prime much better the immune system than vaccination. So it is possible, uh, I think in Europe, in at least in Western Europe, we don't have inactivated vaccine. Uh, and I don't think we will have, but maybe in other countries, uh, I think that the possibility to use a, higher, a better vaccine for us, maybe the inactivated one, or another question I think is the dosage of the vaccine. Since I saw, I don't know if you saw the paper published by Notarangelo, and he got a higher level of responder than in our cohort, but they got Moderna. And Moderna has three times the, the antigen amount than Pfizer. So I think we, we don't have to stay in one vaccine. For sure, they should be vaccinated more and more, but we should not stay in one vaccine. May I comment based on, on, the, on the question and the questionnaire? So the timing of the third vaccine is one of the question. And also, do you see a difference on the antibody and the T cell response? Uh, of the timing between the, the doses. Maybe Close can comment that. Yeah. No, I just wanted to ask the same question. It's fantastic. No, I think that's a very important question. And it was, I, I liked it when it was popping up. Um, I think we probably pushed the vaccine in the beginning too close to each other. So, and I think that may have led to failure. And I think it's interesting. It would be nice to compare the UK experience where they pushed for the one vaccine. Everyone is vaccinated once. And therefore, the distance probably in your vaccines was probably longer than in many of our countries where we pushed them very close and that they should have within three to four weeks latest the second vaccine, which I, I think was actually probably not ideal. I agree with that. I think hearing just basically answering she wants a um, question briefly, um, from our side, I agree very much with both that, and I thank both of you for excellent data. <clears throat> so sorry. Um, I think one question which remains from Alex's data a little bit is really the question, if you don't show any response, is it really worth continuing? Because we're now having the people who have had third vaccine uh, vaccinations, and they ask us, I didn't show any response, shall I continue? And, and I actually, to be honest, I think you basically exploit the um, health system and probably waste vaccinations at some point. So I think it is an in interesting question, which I think is worth trying to answer whether that holds true, what you're seeing, that if you don't show zero response after two vaccinations or three, I don't care about the exact number, 
Um, maybe it's not worth continuing on that. And then we need to, what Isabella also already wrote, we just hope for antibodies appearing in the, in the in immunoglobulin preparations. And again, hope that some levels are reached which give you some passive um, protection. So Alex, I'm going to up and then I'm going to come to Philomene with some pediatric questions. So Alex, what did you want to come back on? May I comment only in one thing? We have one third of patients that did not respond after two doses. They respond after the third one. So I'm not sure that we have to stop. Only one third of patients continue to be zero after the three third doses. And Klaus, I think we don't know yet what is the best vaccine. And I've also seen data similar with Isabella about the Moderna and the dosing around that being important. And, you know, these are immunogenic vaccines. And I think if we can get them tailored to our patient group, we may be able to achieve some response. But I don't think we're at a point yet when we can say that it's not worth vaccinating. I mean, in terms of the, um, the dosing interval at the beginning, we've published in healthy individuals um, just in the last couple of weeks and we were able to compare in healthcare workers, those that had a three week um, interval and those that had a three month interval and those that had the antibody and the T cells at, uh, with the longer interval did much better. Um, because of the rollout in the UK, it was healthcare workers first. So we don't have that data in our patients. All our patients had three month data, but we do have that in health controls. And Klaus, sorry, only one thing, since you are an expert on B cells, uh, memory B cells appear in the CVID only after the third doses, not after the second one. So I think we should be careful and we should continue to study. Yeah, I agree with you. And I didn't want to say that this is the conclusion. I just say that I think it is worth, because patients will ask us, and you know, like again, no vaccine response, again, no vaccine response. And the question is, how often will you continue? So I, I agree, we, we have to say we don't know the answer. I very much agree. I very much like the data. It's very encouraging to see third dose um, will give some patients definitely a benefit. Again, with the big questions, do they reach levels which are, they are protected? And I find, Alex, your data very interesting and important that four of your patients who had COVID after two doses already produced antibodies. And so it actually, again, and I think that's what we also see in healthy people. And, you know, and Isabella, we have right now an agama globulinemia patient, 31-year-olds on intensive care. Um, the only risk factor is adipositas. Um, I have no clue um, why he ended up there. And he's now... Um, Briefly, I mean, I think he will be an ECMO um, probably tomorrow. Um, so I think there are a lot of things there, which I think we will, I agree with you, we will need to continue to learn. But that's why I appreciate so much sharing these data. Um, and I think we have to be open for single patients behaving different from what we saw in the others. Yeah, and it certainly, it certainly um, drives the need for further specific research around this area in our patient cohort, doesn't it? Yes. Um, Philomene, for children, uh, what are you recommending to pediatric patients with immune deficiency? I guess that most of the data has been collected and presented so far as in adults. Well, to be honest, uh, in, in children, so, so first on, on the survey, as you've seen that uh, the, major, the minority of the patients were uh, children. Um, so I, based also from our own experience in, in Belgium, so only since the summer, we are vaccinating children older than 12 years old. Um, and first, the patients with PID were prioritized. And now we are looking what for younger children. I think it's clear and we are all convinced that we need to vaccinate all the young children children who are at risk for severe COVID, and I don't need to repeat again that these are patients with type 1 interferon disorders that needs to be um, vaccinated. But we have another cover that we want to discuss uh, briefly here, is what about vaccination in uh, healthy children with the previous history of MIS-C? Um, maybe some of you joined or also the previous webinar on MIS-C in, in July, and no, six months later, so at that time, it was decided and concluded that that uh, patients with the history of MIS-C were contraindicated to receive a COVID vaccination. Today, we are six months later, and I just wanted to know what's the opinion, maybe, of someone of the audience. Uh, do we still need 
to uh, mention to the patients that it's contraindicated because so far we know that some countries, mainly in the US and I think also in the UK, that they do vaccinate patients with the history of MIS-C. Um, so this is really a burning question. Um, and uh, last time we, say, we said, no, it's contraindicated, which is uh, the approach in France and also in, in our hospital. But we need to discuss, um, um, I don't know if there are some comments or maybe someone of you of the audience or close, you, you want to comment that? And does anybody else want to come in on that? Yeah. I guess maybe. So, so do we, yeah. Do we still recommend not, is it, do we still recommend that it's contraindicated? Uh, what I hear is that maybe it's contraindicated within three months after the acute episode of MIS-C and that we need to postpone the vaccination um, in this patient. Or is it still contraindicated? Because we know that the antibody response is temporarily also in these children. That sounds like something we're gonna need to come back to in the whole of the seminar. Yeah, but I just want to mention that we launched a survey together with Peter Olbrich uh, to answer that question. So um, I hope if you receive that mail, you send that forward to your pediatric colleagues that we can fill in that survey that we know that if you have experience with vaccinating these uh, patients and there are no side effects that we can recommend these patients also to be vaccinated. Yeah. Um, I think that we have some more questions. I will look in the in the Q and A session. Um, so, Philomene, I think if we have, we probably have time for one or two if they're fairly brief, um, and then we've got a couple of things just to wrap up. Yeah. Well, one of the no. So the first question is: Is vaccination in IPEX patients is that contraindicated? So, can I just broaden up and say: Does do any of the panelists? Con uh, suggest that there are groups of patients who should not be vaccinated with PID. Mm -hmm. Isabella, is there anybody you're not that you're saying do not vaccinate? No, uh, Alex is shaking his head, shaking her head. Klaus, I think the only thing I would say is um, active immune disease. So if you have a patient who is going through thrombocytopenia, so we have seen patients with on. Um, severe thrombocytopenia after vaccinations, which were already active. Um, and so I think that would be my hint. And I think that's also my hint for Martin. I think it's probably not so helpful to look at total systemic um, systemic side effects and adverse events, because fever and things like that will be very common. I think it would be more interesting to see whether you see unusual um, systemic, like you reported, like thrombocytopenia and things whether you then I can identify suddenly a patient group where actually these unusual side effects are more common because fever, I think, is, will just overlay everything and you will not discover. Okay. okay. And just to come back to Martin, Martin, I just was wondering if you could comment on, uh, there's a, clearly a discrepancy within Europe about hesitancy for vaccination um, and across different countries. Have you got any comments about that or how that it would be best addressed? Yeah, uh, of course, there are the discrepancy mostly in access, but uh, also in um, in the anti-vax movement, because of course our patients are under this kind of influence as well. And, um, and of course, uh, I, I have to say that most government, when they communicated on vaccination, that they mostly said immunodeficiencies. And for our patient, this is really difficult for, uh, for, for them to sort out if they, this applies to them or not. And this applied for the first, for the second, and now for the third dose. And this is really a difficulty that we face all the time. So let know people if they are in the group uh, that is prioritized or not. Uh, another thing that we face is that uh, uh, we speak of a third dose, but some speak of a, um, a boost. And the, the patient, they don't understand if this is a boost, meaning half dose, or if this is a full dose how this will uh, be handled with the, the flu. Uh, so th there, there are things like this that are really difficult to, to deal with for them. Um, and then, of course, when they have underlying uh, condition, uh, in addition to the PIDs and especially autoimmune uh, condition or when they have said steroid or that kind of treatment, of course, they are, they are afraid or if they fear allergies. And, and there, I have to say that advice is scarce. This is difficult for a patient to get an advice on that. And are you planning to update your the advice on the IPOPI website as a result of your survey? It is. 
Oh, uh, no, I, I mean, uh, the, the recommendation that were uh, endorsed by all the, the, the medical societies, and uh, some of you uh, contribute, Klaus in particular, uh, are updated. And also we added the, the monoclonal antibody thing because we thought that it was really important to get uh, to give some guidance on that because also there, all the patients wanted to have a third job and they wanted to have uh, monoclonal antibody because they think that they will prevent the condition. Uh, when it's not the case at all, uh, uh, as far as I understand. Um, and then we have another issue that arises, is that we can uh, see, and yesterday we, we lost a patient 30 years old, uh, the CVID, and is, did this person die because of uh, the PID or because this could happen in general public, you know, and this is difficult for the patient to understand if this is because this is so with this uh, virus or if this is linked to the PID, especially when a PID patient dies. May I just comment also from the results of the resistance that we see that many patients think if you had already had a COVID infection, that there is no added value to be vaccinated because they think that they will not produce antibodies. It's nicely presented by, by uh, Isabella and Alex that we really need to convince these patients that although you were uh, infected already with COVID, it's really important to receive the vaccine. I think this is also something that we need to add maybe as a recommendation to yeah, decrease yeah. the resistance of these patients and also to encourage for a third vaccine. Yeah, and, and we see that many patients want to be tested because they believe that if they can see antibodies or even uh, if they get uh, an illness spot, they, they see some T cell effect. Um, and they, this is really difficult for them to understand the fact that they supply to a population, but not to an individual person, the results. And this is really difficult to understand that. Um, so we, we, we try, and also I have to say that uh, their advisors, I mean, um, for example, GPs, they don't know about um, cellular immunity. They know about uh, antibody, but they don't know. So they tell them, well, you, you don't produce antibody, no, no way to have a vaccine, it's not of no use. And this is difficult for them to, <laughs> you know, to sort out the, the, the yeah. thing. So we, yeah. There is a lot of education to, to, to be made on immunity, I have to say, and not only among GPs, because I, I have some testimony from oncologists or from hematologists, uh, hematologists who, who say that, uh, well, no antibody, no vaccine. Yeah, I mean, I guess that there is a responsibility for those of us who look after patients with antibody deficiency to make sure we've put in the letter to their GPs that they need to be vaccinated. Um, so I'm just going to round up because I'm conscious of time, but I have one last question for the panel members. Um, so, we, I mean, we, we, I guess in terms of further research, we need to know whether if we vaccinate enough, we're going to get enough of our patients protected against COVID, break, COVID infection. But if we end up in the position that despite multiple vaccinations, we still have a cohort of patients who don't make a response, um, or don't make a response we think is going to be good enough to protect them. What is your view about passive uh, protection? Um, are you going to go just for, so Isabella said that I think that monoclonals are now so good at managing acute disease that we can just go for that. How many of you want to go for passive, um, long, long life monoclonals as passive protection? How many are just going to wait for immunoglobulin to provide some kind of antibodies? So I'm going to go Isabella, Alex, and Klaus. Um, what are you going to do, Isabella? No, I just said my opinion. I think they should continue to be vaccinated. We should continue to study. And monoclonal antibodies are a very good opportunity. And I think for now, uh, the titers we reach after, I didn't show the slide, but the titers we reach after monoclonal antibodies persist at high level for many months. So I think... When the patient asks for monoclonal antibodies as prophylaxis, they are right. Oh, really? No, it's interesting. <laughs> do you want to go for just treatment monoclonals? Do you want to go for prophylaxis? Do you just want to go wait for immunoglobulin? Well, we're just starting a study, Siobhan, to look at prophylaxis with a long-acting monoclonal to try and get us over this winter period. So hoping that's starting in the next few weeks. I mean, what concerns me about relying on immunoglobulin antibodies, um, these will be antibodies from the first wave and then the second wave. 
So these will be Wuhan antibodies and alpha antibodies predominantly. And we already know that they don't produce good neutralization against Delta. So I think we are not out the woods over the next few months with um, relying on immunoglobulin. So it's going to either be prophylaxis or early treatment, as I Isabella says, get them in early. Yes, and more importantly, monoclonals are active against all strain of viruses we have now, while immunoglobulin will not. And I think so, patient uh, antibodies aren't sufficient, and actually it is how we use them with standard of care, with remdesivir, um, and obviously with steroids um, is, is important. Yeah, that's good. That's good. They can be also used in the future as intramuscular. And I think uh, is a, I, I. Oops, Isabella is frozen. Klaus, I might give you the opportunity to come in now. But if she saw us out too quickly, then I'm out. Sorry, Isabella, you just you froze on us now. So we yeah. missed the very last bit of what you said. Sorry, uh, I'm saying that uh, all monoclonals we have are active against all strain of viruses are circulating now. First good news. Second news is that I think that immunoglobulins might contain in the future immunoglobulins, but against the strain is not circulating now, and maybe they will be at very low level in the immunoglobulin, even if the donors uh, uh, were vaccinated. So I think uh, prophylaxis with monoclonal uh, and the monoclonal will might be used as intramuscular and then uh, not in uh, in the hospital setting so they can be also administered at home so i think for us for our patients are a good opportunity they cost a lot of money well good more areas for research klaus what do you what's your bias I think I think the great thoughts are given. Um, I just think that um, I don't see it quite feasible that we will give it to all of our antibody deficiencies monoclonals at this time. I think this will be a financial issue, and and so I think for the time being, I think um, giving them vaccinations. Um, I think as much as we can, learning from it, um, improving the vaccination, and trying to um, create T cell immunity, which we have failed completely different to what we saw in influenza, I must say. I think that's different. Um, I think that combined with early treatment in cases where we do see it. Um, and long term, I just hope that they um, that we will get immunoglobulin preparations which are spiked with uh, monoclonals of all different kinds. I think that would be probably the future way to go, you know, like that companies just understand that they will have to spike them with anti-pneumococcal. If you test our patients who are under replacement, Many serotypes are not covered uh, sufficiently, and so I think that will be true for many things. But I think that would be my hope for the future: um, antibody preparations spiked with monoclonals in there, um, protecting against different pathogens. Yeah, but COVID will not last for years. I think this is a matter of I hope one or two years. So we don't have to think that we will all our life. With COVID, I hope we have to make short and medium plan, not long term plan. Hmm. Okay, I'm going to wind up because that, that could open a whole other full seminar. Um, I would just really like to thank the panel members. That was there was and the speakers and the panel members. That was a really great, uh, a great set of data and a great discussion, and I, hopefully really helpful for everybody um, who is listening in. And thanks to all the participants who have held on there, despite the fact that we're running slightly over. I hope you found it really helpful. And we will put something on the Clinical Working Party website with some answers to questions. Thank you, everybody.